part B. In this part of the test, you'll hear six different extracts. In each extract, you'll hear people talking in a different healthcare setting. For questions 25 to 30, choose the answer A, B or C, which fits best according to what you hear. You'll have time to read each question before you listen. Complete your answers as you listen. Now look at question 25. A thyroid scan provides information about your thyroid size, shape and position. During a thyroid scan, a radioactive material called a radio tracer is swallowed and is absorbed by your body. It travels through the area being examined and gives off energy in the form of gamma rays, which are detected by a special camera and computer to create images of your thyroid. A thyroid scan tests your thyroid's function. It measures how much radioactive iodine is taken up by your thyroid in a given period of time. You will be given the radioactive iodine in liquid or capsule form. During the exam, you will sit in a chair and a probe will be positioned over your thyroid while a scanner moves over your neck. To prepare for these tests, you may be asked not to eat or drink anything and to refrain from taking certain medications beforehand. Leave any jewelry at home and wear loose, comfortable clothing you may be asked to wear a gown. Tell your doctor if there's any possibility you are pregnant or if you're breastfeeding. Discuss any recent illnesses or other medical conditions, medications you're taking, and whether you have any allergies. Also, tell your doctor if you've had any procedures within the last two months that used iodine-based contrast material. You may have some concerns about thyroid scan and uptake. However, because the amount of radio tracer used is small, the level of radiation exposure is relatively low and the benefit of an accurate diagnosis far outweighs any risk. Question 26. At a hospital discharge meeting, the patient would meet with the nurse, the physiotherapist and the pharmacist on the ward. The nurse would go through all the information the patient would need to go home and often relatives are invited to come along um, to listen to the information as well. Um, the nurse would talk about um, managing, managing wounds at home, um, looking after the wounds, making sure they remain clean and dry, um, looking out for signs of infection, um, for example redness or swelling or if the wounds become oozy. And if anything of those happens, the nurse would advise the patient to go and see their GP straight away. Uh, the nurse would also talk about um, the rehabilitation process and would include information about um, dietary concerns, um, exercise um, and smoking cessation if the patients are still smoking. The physiotherapist would talk about exercises the patient needs to do following the surgery. Um, it's really important for the patients to get up and mobilise around um, and the physiotherapist would give some um, exercises for the patient to do every day and would encourage the patient to walk as much as possible um, and build up the walking um, time each day um, with their relatives. The pharmacist would talk about the tablets that the patient is going to be on following their surgery. Um, often tablets change um, whilst the patient's in surgery and uh, the pharmacist would talk about the tablets, explain the side effects, any issues related to those tablets and would explain when to take the tablets as well. And those tablets normally would be uh, reviewed in the outpatient clinic post-cardiac surgery and to see if they are still needed. Question 27. Today I'm going to be talking about a BIAMP overhead paging system along with a Roland Borg nurse call system and the power of connecting those two together. We can automate code blue processes so that when a code blue is pressed, it can automate a response overhead to the paging system, which I'll demonstrate right now.
Attention. Code blue. Room. 501. Medical ICU. Okay, now the power of this is that, like it said, medical ICU right there, we can add any suffix we want onto that and give clear delineation on where the code blue is coming from and where the staff needs to go to respond to that code. I can make it repeat. We can add different preambles, as you heard a preamble before that. It is really a powerful tool, and I'd love to talk to you about it. Question 28. Today I am answering a question about preschool stuttering. So how long do we wait? Well, Mark Onslow of the Australian Stuttering Research Center recommends that a speech therapist should monitor a child for signs of natural recovery for about six months, but no longer. So that's his recommendation. He also explains that there are other reasons that you may want to begin therapy sooner, and that would be if the child becomes distressed about the stuttering, you want to go ahead and address it at that point because psychological damage could start to happen. Also, if the stuttering is causing social problems or psychological issues. So if it's interfering with social interactions or any of that kind of stuff, you definitely want to go ahead and address it sooner than that six months. So that being said, what do we do? How do we um, go about fixing stuttering in preschoolers? Well, Although there have been many different types of stuttering therapy over the, over the years, there was a systematic review in 2006 by Booth and all of his or her associates, I can't remember if that's a woman or a man, and that study found that the response contingency approach was the most effective treatment for children who stutter. So if you would like to find out more about the response contingency approach, you can click on this link down here. It should be in the show notes right below this video. Um, it's speechandlanguagekids.com slash stop stutter preschoolers current research-based methods with dashes in between all of that so just go in, down there and click the link um, and that will take you to my page all about response contingency stuttering therapy uh, there's a video that explains it and demonstrates it so head on over there and check that out if you have any further questions please leave those below and I'll get back to you as soon as possible thanks so much and have a great day question 29 First and foremost, I think 20 is the new 25. When we studied glaucoma in school, most people uh, were under the impression that 25 millimeters of mercury was the high end of normal. We found that recently, 20 mil at 20 millimeters of mercury, the intraocular pressure is elevated enough um, to be adequate, but at 25, it's really starting to affect axoplasmic flow on the optic nerve. So really aim for a pressure of 20 in your veterinary patients. Other things that are new in the realm of glaucoma in pets include um, the realm of neuroprotection, so medications like memantine, timolol, bimatoprost, and minocycline, which may actually protect the nerve and the nerve function. We are starting to look at glaucoma as more of a neurodegenerative disease, so not only an, a disease of the eye, but also a disease of the brain, um, and it can actually be affected by systolic blood pressure as well as intracranial pressure. Question 30. The goal of this paper, this health policy statement, is to give a uniform document where all laboratories can, can find the information they need and utilize that information to communicate in all aspects of healthcare to improve patient quality. I've had the experience over uh, my career through Sky, working on the Quality Committee, through uh, Accreditation Committee and ACE, um, and uh, through Lab Surveys Committees, to see there's significant variation in all laboratories, with, uh, amongst multiple laboratories, uh, about the catheterization lab. Some using pros, some using documentation, some multiple entries for billing and inventory and databases and every different entry has the potential of an error. Um, the goal of this report is to take that potential error out of it and improve patient quality. The emphasis that we had throughout this effort was to make this as uniform for the, the laboratories, 
for the vendors, for all to, to make it easy to transfer data, to make it non-repetitive, and have a uniformity across all, all fields. That is the end of part B. Part C. In this part of the test, you'll hear two different extracts. In each extract, you'll hear health professionals talking about aspects of their work. For questions 31 to 42, choose the answer A, B or C, which fits best according to what you hear. Complete your answers as you listen. Now look at extract 1. Extract 1, questions 31 to 36. You now have 90 seconds to read questions 31 to 36. Sophie, I thought this article was really fascinating, not least because after years, maybe decades of debate on the downsides of medicine and overdiagnosis, it seems quite incredible that we don't quite know what we're talking about still. Um, and you seem to have been working hard to really try and understand and define what too, too much medicine is. Can you set the scene for us a bit and, and tell us how you got into this and why it's important to try and define these concepts? Yeah, absolutely. So, as you know, Helen, this paper kind of started with a really interesting experience at the second international overdiagnosis, well, preventing overdiagnosis conference. We all talked about overdiagnosis animatedly for three days and we, were, we had a sense of solidarity and we agreed that this was a problem and it needed to be fixed. And then on the fourth day, there was a special invitation only meeting of experts. So, just, just people that were really engaged with research about overdiagnosis to try and set the research agenda for the next 12 months. And the very first session was called, I think, Nailing Down the Definition of Overdiagnosis. And there was two hours devoted to this session. And so these are all people who've been thinking about overdiagnosis a lot. And it became apparent within the first 15 minutes that there was no way that we were going to nail down a definition of overdiagnosis that way, that, that day, because everyone was using the word in a slightly different way way. Um, so, we all, we all had this general shared intuitive sense that we were all interested in the same problem or similar problems or related problems, but we weren't completely clear what we meant when we said this word, overdiagnosis. So, we came away from that meeting really motivated to try to unpack why that could be, why these very well-intentioned, very smart expert people um, were not using this word in exactly the same way. And why is it important to have clarity on that word? What's it stopping us doing or what conversations can't we have without its definition? I think 
Overdiagnosis is such a difficult thing to approach in policy terms, in clinical terms, and I find even just talking with my friends about overdiagnosis, it's quite counterintuitive um, and it can be very difficult to talk about in a way um, that convinces people that it is a problem that we need to do something about. And I think if we're not clear ourselves what we're talking about, it becomes very difficult for us to be clear with policymakers and with the general public that this is a problem that we need to do something about. And we also, if we're not clear, I think we potentially waste a lot of energy within the research and clinical community talking across purposes. If we're all using the word to mean different things and talking past each other, we waste a lot of energy. Um, but if we can be clearer amongst ourselves what exactly this problem is that we're trying to solve, we've kind of we've we've uh, leaped the first hurdle towards trying to solve the problem. And and the problem really, I think, the people that are focused on the problem of too much medicine. Um, are really mostly concerned that medicine is harming people when it, it doesn't mean to um, and that we're allocating resources in a way that doesn't get the best benefit for the people who need um, medical care. So it's it's motivated by good reasons, wanting to prevent harm and wanting to make sure that there's the maximum amount of benefit. Um, but until we cl we're clear exactly on what overdiagnosis is, it's hard to achieve those things that we're trying to achieve. And what are the key things themes that emerge because I went to some of your sessions and you might think walking into the sessions at the conference that overdiagnosis is quite a numerical black and white issue but actually in the setup to this article you explain that it's it's actually far more complicated than that and to an extent overdiagnosis or too much medicine is in the eye of the beholder and there's a lot of judgment and ethics and messy stuff in there um, tell us a bit about that it's true, it's true. So part of the challenge of overdiagnosis is that it's a really complicated scientific problem. So there's amazing people, including my colleague Alex Barrett, who you'll be speaking with later, who've, who've dedicated many years of their career to trying to work out how to produce accurate, trustworthy scientific measurement of the size of overdiagnosis. So it's definitely a scientific problem. Um, but we can't reduce it just to some kind of ideal of value-free science where we just get the maths right and then we know how big it is and then we know what to do. And the reason for that is that overdiagnosis is fundamentally about or too much medicine is fundamentally about trying to identify the situations in which medicine is doing more harm than good or medicine is not delivering a net benefit. Um, and as soon as you start talking about harm and benefit, you're in the realm of ethics. You're in the realm of weighing up goods and bads. And as soon as you start talking about harm and benefit, you have to ask, as you said, from whose perspective? So whose ideas about harm and benefit should matter when we weigh up whether to do a particular test or whether to offer a particular drug? Should it be the patient's assessment of benefit and harm, the clinician's risk? researchers, all of them, if they disagree, how should we adjudicate between them? If there's different benefits and different harms that all have to be weighed up, then how do we do that weighting? So, And that that's moral territory. It's ethical territory. So it, that needs to be a conversation that, that is quite explicit and a conversation that brings in citizens, that brings in the public, um, which is why it's so important to have good public conversations about too much medicine. And if we want to address too much medicine. Um, we also need to recognise that it's a social problem. You know, this, this is a problem that comes from the social systems that we humans create for ourselves. So um, it's driven by things like clinicians who are pushed and pulled by incentives and penalties in the systems that they work in and clinicians who feel threatened by medico-legal threats to, to do more testing and to make sure that they've covered every base or companies who are required to make a profit and so they might sell tests or sell drugs harder than they should to try and make more money or things like the increasing rise of direct-to-consumer um, selling of tests um, like genomic tests. So, you know, spit in a vial and send it off in the post and you can get information about your genome sent back to you in a couple of weeks. So, these 
social forces are an important part of what creates overdiagnosis, what motivates it, what drives it. So if we're going to be able to address it effectively, we've got to acknowledge and take seriously that social aspect of overdiagnosis or too much medicine. So the science is critical, but the ethical and social dimensions are just as critical and, and in fact should feed into the science if it's going to be good science. So setting out these definitions must have been no no easy thing. And it sounds like there's a huge grey zone <laughs> um, in terms of how, how we're going to be able to think and deal with them. In your article, you've got an enormous table, um, I guess, informed by the opinions of all these different experts who were feeding in their thoughts about what overdiagnosis was. Can you explain for the reader some of the, some of the broad um, themes that are in there? Yeah, absolutely. So what we tried to do was to get to the bottom of a difference, actually, because when, when we thought about why those, those well-intentioned, super smart experts in that room couldn't agree on what overdiagnosis was, we concluded that it was possibly because they were using that word at two different levels of generality, so that some of those experts were using the word overdiagnosis in a very specific way to to mark out a very specific concept. And we argue in the paper that this is how the word overdiagnosis should be used, that we should start restricting it to a narrow sense. And that sense is really about the boundaries of the definitions of conditions. So uh, the narrow sense of overdiagnosis, which is the first line in our table, um, is when a person is diagnosed with a condition, but that diagnosis doesn't produce a benefit for that person. So it's a very particular problem and it's about rethinking the boundaries of diagno diagnoses, diagnostic categories, and thinking about those boundaries not in terms of can we make sure that we find every case or can we make sure that we treat every person or can we leave no stone unturned, but instead it's about thinking what will the benefits be, what will the harms be, how can we weigh them up against each other, how can we be sure that the benefits are likely to outweigh the harms. So that concept of overdiagnosis is quite narrow, quite specific. It's and it really label. needs to be Yeah, it is. It's about when is it a good thing to label this person? So when is it likely to benefit this person to give them this label? And it really has to be negotiated condition by condition because um that decision obviously has to be made um in collaboration between the clinicians and the patients and the researchers that are working on that very particular problem. So overdiagnosis in that narrow sense we're arguing, arguing in the paper should be the only way that we use the word overdiagnosis. And we've adopted the BMJ term too much medicine to encapsulate a whole lot of other problems that are related to but not the same as. Now look at extract two. Extract two. Questions 37 to 42. You now have 90 seconds to read questions 37 to 42. Breast cancer is not one single disease, but actually 10 distinct types of tumour, dependent upon a woman's genetic makeup. 
That is the finding of the largest ever study of breast cancer tissue and could provide more targeted treatment. Our science editor, Tom Clark, is here to tell us more. Tom, it sounds dramatic. Ten different diseases, effectively. This study is, is one of the most sort of powerful in, in recent years to illustrate the what new genetic technologies are allowing scientists to do in sort of redefining how they understand disease. And it's a big step towards this idea of tailoring disease treatment to the individual, this idea of personalised medicine, in this case, for breast cancer. Nowadays, today, at diagnosis, how serious a breast tumour is, is largely judged based on how well uh, tests, how, how it responds to tests for the two particular breast cancer drugs there are available to treat the disease. And this study sort of turns all that on its head. It looks at 2,000 tumours from women in the UK and in Canada. It's the largest study of its kind. And what it found by looking at thousands of genetic mutations within those tumours is that, yes, breast cancer isn't one disease, but it falls into 10 very discrete genetic groups. And which genetic family the breast cancer belongs to has a strong bearing on how serious that tumour might be and how well it responds to treatment. For example, one class that they've, they've identified, which according to current tests would be grouped as you know, quite difficult to treat, in fact only has about a 10% mortality rate after 10 years, not such a severe type of cancer. Conversely, another group uh, that they've identified, which would have a sort of fairly positive treatment profile based on current tests, which in fact has a 60% mortality after 10 years, a really nasty type of tumour. More interestingly, um, another new class that seems to belong to these very lucky group of women whose immune system gets involved and sort of fights their, their cancer for them, a particular interest to scientists. And as the report's author told us um, earlier, this should ensure in future that women get the right treatment for their disease. If it's 10 diseases, it means that they'll require different diagnostic procedures, they will be associated with different clinical outcomes, and they will require different treatments. And so it's a big step forward in terms of how we manage women with breast cancer and how we, we need to not think of it as one or two or three diseases, but a much more complex entity that will require, therefore, more tailored treatment. More tailored? So less mastectomy, more mastectomy, less tamoxifen, I mean, how's it going to look? dictate how a doctor, the, the, the tools the doctor has in his armoury to treat cancer, but it will prevent, for example, it will help identify those women who've got a particularly nasty type of tumour and make sure they get the right kind of treatment early on, possibly the more radical types of treatment. But it could also, on the other hand, and just as importantly, spare some women very toxic, very expensive chemotherapy that their tumour might not necessarily need. Um, I should point out that they've identified these 10 groups. It doesn't mean these tests will be available tomorrow. They've got to do clinical trials to prove that what they've seen in this study translates into the hospital environment. But Cancer Research UK, which funded the work, and now immediately they're going to start funding trials to look into this. So there's the chance that women who are newly diagnosed with, with breast cancer will be able to enrol in those studies. I'll just mention one more thing. Looking at all these, you, you, you asked about new tools in the armoury. Um, women, uh, by looking at so many genes in this study, they've identified some quite promising new targets for those uh, for, for, for companies to look at to develop new medicines for treating breast cancer. Tom Clark. Now, a quick summary of tonight's news at 7.29. Uh, a Libyan military commander is taking legal action against Jack Straw following allegations the former Foreign Secretary personally permitted his legal, illegal rendition. Lawyers representing Abdul Hakim Belhaj confirmed legal papers had been served on the MP. Unemployment in Britain has fallen for the first time in almost a year. The jobless total fell by 35,000 in the quarter to February to 2.65 million. The government says the figures were a step in the right direction. And as Breivik, who killed 77 people in a bomb and shooting attack in Norway, told the court that the death penalty or a full acquittal were the only logical outcomes for his massacre. And Home Secretary Theresa May has dismissed terror suspect Abu Qatada's latest bid to avoid deportation as a delaying tactic. His lawyers lodged an appeal with Europe's human rights judges, effectively blocking the government's attempts to deport him to Jordan. And still to come tonight... Court. In a moment, cameras are allowed in court for the first time to record the sentencing in a murder trial. Is this the start of a revolution in how we view justice? 
And at 7.38, inspire a generation. The Olympic motto is unveiled as the 100-day countdown begins. That is the end of part C. You now have two minutes to check your answers.